Flipping to the book of Judges. You're welcome. <laughs> Judges in chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. Uh, Dave mentioned at the front end that we will be doing... Uh, sorry, I have to set my timer so that I can ignore it a little later. Um, B Dave mentioned earlier that we're going to be doing baby dedications on May 14th, which is Mother's Day. And I just want to reemphasize, I know we've said this a few times, to the extent that I'm almost tempted to teach a class on it on a Wednesday night coming up. But uh, when we do baby dedications, it is not just the fact that they're cute, although they are. And it's not just the fact that we want to recognize the families that have recently had a child, although we do. We're also, though, covenanting with those families to raise those children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and that is not a throwaway statement. That is a huge responsibility for the church and for the family. Now, as good biblical Christians, we understand none of us can manipulate a child's heart. Well, you could probably try to manipulate a heart, but you understand what I mean. None of us can save our children, right? You cannot reach inside of a heart and cause them to follow Christ. But what we're called to do, and I once heard this illustration, so I'll steal it. This isn't original. Well, what, what you're called to do is to prepare that fire. A fire only God can light, and yet we're to stack the sticks around it, we're to prepare the wood, we're to stoke that campfire to the extent to where when God is, is pleased to light that spark, that it will roar into a roaring fire. That's what we're called to do as parents and as a church with these young ones. I'll keep referring you to the words of the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. When they were called to teach their kids that Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, they were teaching their kids who God is, teaching the next generation to look to the Savior and to worship Him. So that being said, we're looking forward to doing that, but we will be in the book of Judges today. And the reason we're doing that is Dave uh, Wilson is going to be preaching next week, and then the following week we're going to be picking up into 2 Thessalonians. So we're still continuing in Thessalonians. I didn't want to jump out of that um, for one week and then kind of come back to it. So we'll be reading Judges today. So I'm going to invite you to stand if you are able. We stand to honor the reading of God's Word. I'll be reading Judges 3, 1 through 6. After I read the passage, you'll hear me affirm, this is the Word of the Lord. And at that point, I encourage you to respond with, thanks be to God. Hear now the Word of the living God. Judges chapter 3, verse 1. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and Sidonians and Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hamon as far as Labo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord God, please bless, Lord, the reading and the preaching of your word this morning. God, we are a grateful people to gather. God, we're a grateful people to accept your word. We're a grateful people to know the name of the true and living God. Lord, would you stoke the fires of our own hearts this morning? Would you turn our affections to you? Would you, even now, Lord, with the children that are gathered here in this building, Lord, would you stoke the fires in their hearts? Would you help us, Lord, as we disciple those that come after us to turn their eyes to the living God and to know and to worship you all the days of their life, God. Would you be pleased to work through our church, and would you do so, Lord, not so we may be great or so we may be proud, Lord, but for the glory of your name and your name alone. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So, a little bit of background. We have been, as I mentioned, in 1 Thessalonians now for a while. Um, we had to depart from it last, or not depart from it, but finish it last week. Um, but why judges? 
Um, one overriding reason is because uh, we are probably going to be moving into Ezra and Nehemiah next. Spoiler alert. After we finish First and Second Thessalonians, I suspect we're going to be moving into Ezra and Nehemiah. We're continuing to preach Old New Testament as, as a general rule. Um, but I love the book of Judges. And this was really a, a, a struggle in my mind to go to Judges or to go to Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, so I'm going to re retain the right to occasionally preach from the book of Judges. If we do not preach all the way through the book at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and retain that right to, to, to visit here when we can. And one of the reasons why I feel like Judges is so pertinent for us and can be so encouraging, challenging and yet encouraging for us, if you're familiar with the book of Judges, many people skip it. Um, it's a dark book. It's a book that has a lot of very strange, challenging stories within the book. But if you were to look at the book of Judges, it's, it's sort of a worsening spiral of man's sin and then God's intervention out of that sin. So you have this constant theme within the book of Judges, men sort of spiraling, even God's people, in their rejection of God. Are you, are you picturing the kind of downward spiral? Because it keeps getting worse and worse, and it almost seems quicker and quicker and quicker. The destruction is even worse, and yet God's redemption out of that time and again. Man spiral, yet God snatches them up. But the reason judges become so wearing on the soul is the cycle then continues. And it goes back into sin and back into rebellion and destruction, and then God again rescuing his people, and then the cycle continues. In that regard, I feel that Judges is eminently applicable to our time, but to many times throughout Christian history. The propensity of people, and even God's people, to wander far from God into destruction, into chaos, and then God to snatch them out. So we're going to be in Judges chapter 3, but let me give you a, a very brief 30,000-foot flyover of where we have been in, or where the book of Judges has been up to this point. Judges chapter 1, we have the continuing contest, uh, conquest of Canaan. This is following Joshua's death. So Joshua has now died. They are continuing uh, the conquest of Canaan, but Israel ultimately fails to complete that conquest. Completed in one sense, not completed in another sense. That's chapter 1 of Judges. Chapter 2, we have Joshua's death, the details then of Joshua's death. We have Israel's sin and idolatry becoming very, uh, very apparent within the camp, so to speak. And then we have God's appointing, because of the sin in the camp and because of the need for leadership, judges to not only lead the people of Israel, but also to protect and preserve the people of Israel. This is the name of the book then, these judges that God appoints over his people. And you get a little bit of a snapshot. If you're there in your Bible, flip back to Judges 2.10. You get a little bit of a snapshot of where we're moving in Judges. Judges chapter 2, verse 10 says, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, which is another way of saying they've passed away. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Let me pause there for a minute. That, that little snapshot, Judges 2, verse 10, this is sort of the, the problem that we keep revisiting in Judges. And I want you to just try to somehow make this applicable to today. I hope you can understand the sarcasm that I'm bleeding with right now. Just try to make this applicable to where we stand today in Christianity in the West. So we have God who has tremendously blessed a people. He has given them tremendous light. Tremendous light among the darkness. He's taught them his law. He's taught them to trust them repeatedly and patiently. He's taught them to love and to follow the God of the covenants. And then even past him giving them that light, he has commissioned them to be a light into the nation. I'm talking about judges, by the way, not, not us, right? Just try to make it applicable. Yet another generation, we're told, came after them. This is a generation that we're told did not know the Lord or did not know what he had done for the previous generation. They simply had deaf ears and deaf eyes to what had come before them and did not know these things. And therefore, this new generation was very prone to reject the God they served. Very prone to reject God. And here in our passage, we'll see, prone to forget conflict with the darkness. Prone to forget the wars that have, God has brought them through. Prone, ultimately, to leave the covenant God. This is the frustration of the book of Judges, this downward spiral of forgetfulness and absent-mindedness concerning heavenly things and ultimately plunging them into destruction. Let me put it a little differently. This is about a generation that may well have thought that when they looked around them and they saw their success and they saw the fruit of their accomplishments, they may well have been tempted to think those were the fruit of their own efforts. Look what we have done. That God's law word held very little or even no value for them. 
It's an antiquated thing of the past. That they did not live, excuse me, that they and, and those who did not live lives in constant thankfulness for the God who had provided. Think back to Exodus. Think the whole Exodus motif here. The God who has hand-fed his people through his provision. And yet this generation thinks their own, their own efforts have brought about this fruitfulness. Again, I'm still speaking about the book of Judges, not today. Our passage here in this book, it takes place in the setting of warfare. There's going to be war in the passage we're picking up today, but I want you to notice this is ultimately a setting of love and affection. That's the backdrop for all of this language of war, language of being strong for the Lord. All of that, the backdrop for it is that a love for God drives our actions. And that's why I felt like this paired quite well with where we've been in 1 Thessalonians. Who we are and what our hearts love is going to drive then how we act and how we're called to live. Who we are drives what we do. In other words, a love for God drives our actions, our obedience, and ultimately it's going to lead to our warfare. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Don't think I'm going to pass out swords after the sermon, but this is, this is key for us. It really is. And as I was reading this passage, I couldn't help but think of us as a church. And I, 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 don't, like doing, I don't like doing silly illustrations that just get a gasp from people, as, as many preachers throughout history have done. But I, I want you to honestly consider, imagine that those of us that are in this room have 10 years left to live on this earth. Again, I'm not doing this just to be silly, like, but let's just consider for a moment. We have 10 years left, and we know this for a fact, okay? Um, how would we parent? Would we parent differently? Would we change anything? Would we focus on anything differently? I think this is a good diagnostic tool. How would we do church if we knew that those of us in this room would pass away in 10 years? Would we do things differently in this church? Would we do longer services? Um, don't worry, I'm not going to preach for two hours today, but would we do different services? Would we focus on certain things? Would we make much of certain things that we do well within this church? In, a, in other words, would it change anything we were doing? I think that's a good and valuable tool because for most of us, we do not live with eternity in mind, right? We, we, we just kind of assume we have time to get things right. But what if we were confronted with that reality? Now, I want you to still imagine we in this room only have 10 years left, but that's not where everything ends. What if our great, 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 great grandchildren are going to still be living and still be occupying this church building? Of course, this one will probably be torn down and they'll have a new one up right at that point. But like, just, just go with the analogy. They're still here, but they're reaping the benefits of what we have done and built in our church here today. We're not enjoying those benefits. We're not living in that reality. And yet our great, 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 great grandchildren will be spiritual beneficiaries of our faithfulness to God and how God blesses faithfulness among his people, would that change anything we do as a church? Would it change anything you do as a parent? Would it change anything you do as just a Christian? I don't want to bury the lead here, so I'm going to give away where we're moving with this, this passage. I think God wants us to dig very deep roots, and I think he wants us to build strong foundations specifically for the generations that will come after us, those people that were up here on the stage. That's why I say baby dedication is not a throwaway Sunday. This matters to the covenant people of God. Deep roots, strong foundations, and I think that's how God is building his kingdom even now, right now. And I think to do that, God is going to graciously allow us to experience war. I don't want to bury the lead. I think if God wants us to dig those deep roots and firm foundations established, He's going to graciously allow us to experience war. Now, let me define what I mean. First thing this morning, love fiercely. As I say, all this is tied to a love for God. So the first thing, love fiercely. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 once more this morning. We read in verse 1, Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. And we'll pause there for just a minute. So our passage begins with a test. And you've all picked up on the test at this point, right? Like this test that God has given to his people specifically in this passage is he has left pagan nations who are opposed to God and he's left them surrounding Israel intermingled in Israel's midst, so to speak. And the fact that God is testing his people here is very important. We're going to visit that soon. 
But I want to focus on who were these nations that surrounded God's people? Who were these pagan nations that were opposing Israel in this passage? Well, first, I would point out these were nations that God had marked for destruction, specifically because of their sin and idolatry. You can pick up on that if you're making notes in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. But this is a, a very difficult concept, I think, for most modern Christians to, uh, to understand. The fact that God would designate nations to destruction. I don't want to get too far off track, but I want us to recognize sin inevitably and always brings destruction. It incurs God's right judgment upon us, upon individuals, families, or nations. And here, we're seeing nations that are arrayed against God, and God has designated them for destruction. Not because God was really cranky in the Old Testament, but because sin is deadly, and God is a holy and just God. Those who rebel against him will incur that wrath. Everybody follow me on that one so far? Just nod, nod either way. So there's a persistent theme, though, in Scripture. Nations just like people groups, just like families, are commanded to follow God. Commanded to follow God. Not that it would be better for these pagan nations if they stopped paganing for a little while and followed the covenant God. No, they are commanded to bow the knee to God. Nations belong to God. All of the nations of the world. Oftentimes we read the Old Testament and we think only Israel actually belonged to God. Now they were in covenant with God, and yet every nation belongs ultimately to the King of Kings. Every king, we're told in Scripture, is set up by God, which is a hard one for us to contemplate sometimes. But every nation must bow to God's law and to God's will. Now, that's true for Israel, specifically God's people here, but it's also true for every kingdom, every nation, every people, under, he uh, under heaven, on earth, we are all called to bow the knee to the king of kings. And that's quite important because God commands every person, every ruler, every people to bow their knee. I want you to flip with me. We're just going to look real quickly at Psalm 2. Flip with me to Psalm 2, and we'll just walk through this very quick. I was tempted to go to Psalm 110, which is the New Testament's favorite Old Testament passage, but, passage, but I thought it was, it was very clear here in Psalm 2, the point I'm trying to draw out. Psalm chapter 2, and I'll just point you to a few of the verses. We won't walk through the whole psalm, but l l let's look at a little bit of this. First, Psalm 2 presents the problem, the problem with nations that are arrayed against God. We see that in the first three verses. Verse number 1, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So there we have the problem. The nations don't want to bow before the king. Their rulers plot against the king. In fact, we're told they rage against the king. This is the situation here in the book of Judges. Let's keep going, though, in verse 3 of Psalm, uh, Psalm excuse me, 2. We have God's response. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. In other words, we can read into this text a little bit. God is quite unconcerned and quite unshaken by nations raising their fist against him. He takes it seriously, but it's not as if this is a challenge to the Almighty God. God, we're told in Scripture, mocks the rebellion of men. It is folly to him. It's foolishness to him. So we have first the problem, then we have God's response, and then we have the warning to men and rulers and nations. I'm going to skip a little bit down to verse 10 there in Psalm 2. Verse 10, here's the kind of now, kings, here's how you ought respond. Verse 10, now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. I'll pause there for a minute. The problem, nations array themselves against God. They shake their fist. God's response, he laughs in derision. The warning, turn to the son. Do not rebel against the king of kings. Every king, every ruler, every nation on earth, bow the knee to God and recognize his rule over all things, lest you incur his judgment. And then in the midst of that, we have this wonderful comfort given for God's people. It's right there in verse 12. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And what a wonderful part of that psalm that is. Blessed, blessed are those who take refuge in the God of covenant. Why do I point out Psalm 2 in the context here? We need to remember First, God takes sin 
very seriously. Even though we're told that the, the king who is in the heavens laughs at these rebellious nations, it's not a laugh as in it's so silly to him. Sin's very serious to God. Nations in rebellion are very serious to God. And we're also reminded all the world, whether it recognizes it or not, it belongs to Christ. Not in the future, not back in the Garden of Eden, but right now, the entirety of the world, all of the cosmos, belongs to the King of Kings. Christ holds it, we're told, in his hands. So although we might see, as we do in this passage, nations that rise and they shake their fist in rebellion, Christ will have his victory. Everybody following me on that one so far? Let's flip back then to Judges. I promise that'll be the only flipping we do today because I know we're outside our normal, uh, our, our normal sermon series. But back to Judges chapter 3. Why were those nations there? Why were they there? It's one, of the, it's one of the challenging parts of the Old Testament. Oftentimes when Israel wanders into a new situation and there's giants in the land, so to speak, and we always wonder, well, why were they there? Why wasn't it just something, some normal situation? We might think it's because Israel failed to drive them out. Ah, these pagan nations are around. Israel's called to drive them out. They didn't. That was on Israel. Maybe those nations are still there because Israel just could not get it done. But instead, we're told here that God had a providential plan. Although Israel didn't drive them out, and although it is on Israel that they didn't drive them out, we're told those nations were there precisely because God decreed that they should be there. But why did God decree that they should be there? Who left them? Verse 1 of our passage here in Judges chapter 3, God left them. And then why did God leave them? Verse 2, only that they, speaking of Israel, might know war. Only because he wanted his people to know war. He's testing his people Israel. And when I say test, I don't want you to get that mixed up in your mind as if God's trying to make Israel falter. God does, not, God does not tempt us to sin. That is a biblical truth, right? God never tempts his people to sin, yet God most certainly puts his people to the test for their own good and for his glory. That is biblically consistent. Not tempting to sin, but testing his people for a good and righteous pur purpose. The Proverbs talk about this in Proverbs 17.3 when we're told the crucible is for silver and the furnace for gold and the Lord tests hearts. What a picture, right? Melting iron, and yet what does God do? He does that to the heart, testing. But we can also say, just as quickly, is God's testing visceral and powerful? Yes, but it's also for our good. And we read this from the book of James in chapter 1. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith, there it is, what does it produce? steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's for our good, not for our destruction, not for our faltering, but for our building and strengthening. So what does failing a test look like? I think that's a good question to ask. If we're being called to do well in this test, and Israel specifically in this passage is being called to do well in this test, what does failing a test look like? Well, for Israel, it's pretty clear. It looks like mixing in with the pagan society around them. It looks like adopting pagan views and values. We have that here in the book of Judges. It looks like Israel marrying pagan women. Again, very clear in the text. It looks like Israel celebrating pagan culture. And it looks like Israel eventually and inevitably worshiping their gods instead of the one true God. That's what failing a test looks like. And in that regard, it looks much the same for us. What does it look like for God's people in 2023 to fail a good and righteous testing of the hearts. Failing that test looks like when we are indistinguishable from the world and we're quite happy to let the whole world be godless, plunging into destruction. That's what failing a test looks like. It looks like when we adopt secular viewpoints and we seek the answers of the world rather than seeking the truth of God revealed in Scripture. That's failing a good test from God. It looks like when we allow our children to be unequally yoked to unbelievers specifically in marriage, that is failing the test of God. It looks like when we try to ignore or avoid the culture or the world around us, and even worse than that, when pressured, we even acquiesce to it or, or condone celebrating the pagan worldview of the world around us. That's failing a good test from God. And what's the end result? The end result of failing that test always looks quite the same in Scripture. It finally ends when we not only accept their idols in our midst, but we wind up worshiping them instead. 
worshiping the very idols of the world around us. And I want you to make no mistake, that is the inevitable conclusion of this slide. The whole book of Judges shows this again and again and again. High places, idols, child sacrifice. How are they keep following into this? Because you will worship. You'll either worship God or you'll worship something in his stead. And it always ends in this place. So who were these pagan nations that were there to test Israel? We're told in the text that these were testing all in Israel who had not experienced the wars in Canaan. All the wars in Canaan. There's been many wars in Canaan that have led up to this point. Judges and even the book of Joshua, or even the book of Joshua, Judges and the book of Joshua, both full of conquest, full of war. Maybe Joshua more so than Judges even in that regard. But why was this necessary? Why did God feel the need to test his people? Well, on the one, one hand, we should always be really careful to put motives into God's mouth, right? God can test because God says he tests, and it's always for our good. So in one sense, we trust him. But we're given some clues in the text here why God felt the need to test these people then. It was necessary because God had freed Israel from slavery and bondage. This is the whole grand narrative of the Old Testament. He has snatched a people out of slavery and made them a people unto himself. He took a destitute, a hopeless people, and he has transformed them into a kingdom of priests that are then conquering a nation, ultimately, for his glory. And in all of that, he's teaching them absolute dependence on him. Dependence that's not just some sort of slavish acquiescence. Dependence that is a loving provision for his people. Let me hold you by the hand. Let me feed you to the mouth. Trust me and let me be your God. A loving obedience to the Lord God. And it was vital for them to remember in that context that God is God and that he's called us to battle. Two things. God is God and he's called us to battle. And with Israel, the problem that they frequently run into is times of peace tend to complicate this a bit. The times of peace and prosperity even, they tend to complicate it. We, we tend as people to become complacent. We, we tend very naturally as people to compromise with the things around us. We become a bit lazy we become a bit compromised in our values, and ultimately we forget that our God is a warrior, that we serve a warrior God who says he is doing nothing short of conquering this world. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to his glory. And here's an appeal, I think, for God's people throughout time. Do not forget the war. Don't forget the war. Don't neglect the sounds of battle. And at this point, I feel compelled to define what I mean by war because I don't want you getting, again, the wrong picture. We're not crusading. What do I mean by war? War is when light confronts darkness. War is when the force of light, specifically God's divine light that is shining in this world, John chapter 1, when it confronts and collides with the forces of darkness that are in this world. That's what war looks like. Now, that doesn't always look like war as we think of it. It doesn't always look like two countries coming head to head, although sometimes it does. We're reading that in the book of Judges. These are countries with armies coming head to head. But what I want to point out is this is an inherently spiritual war. It is light against darkness, and yet it almost never stays in the spiritual realm alone. Why do I say that? Because we're reading a passage right here of Israelites confronted with spiritual warfare, and yet what are they doing? They're bowing the knee to pagan idols. It spills out into our lived experiences. And I point that out because when the disciples were persecuted in the New Testament, they were confronting the forces of darkness with the force of light. And what do we see there? We see spiritual warfare, and yet we see a very physical warfare. They're doing nothing short of confronting Satan and all his, his minions, and yet at the same time, they're confronting Roman soldiers who are hauling them off to be killed. It's spiritual, and yet it spills out into our lived experience. That's what I mean when I say war. It's a spiritual warfare. And again, God's people are not to forget that we are called to war. Now, part of that means that the sounds of battle should not and cannot surprise Christians or God's people throughout all time. 2 Timothy chapter 3 Verse 12 through 13, I'll just refer to it, but we are, we are guaranteed that if we desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, we will face persecution. In other words, there's a certain inevitability of conflict in this world. If you are of the light, you will conflict with the things that are of the dark. As, as much as we try to live good and holy lives, it's an inevitable con, uh, con confrontation. I would also say if Christians find themselves living lives that are absent persecution in any form, it could very well be for the same reasons that Israel was. 
Israel's not facing a whole lot of out and outright uh, warfare here, but there's a very sad reason for that. They've forgotten the war that they're a part of. They've just forgotten the battle that they've been called to. And instead, here in Israel's context, they've gone so far as to make their bed in the enemy's camp. There's still a war. They're just losing. Do you get the picture of that? Finally, I would say this. Because we're in a war, we train those who come after us. We're called to train up those who come after us. I point you to verse 2. It says, It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war. Why? To teach war to those who had not known it before. In other words, God's people need to know how to engage the battles in this world when the light confronts the dark. We can't ignore it, we can't forget it, and we certainly can't train one another to confront it. You're part of something that's much bigger, and we do very poorly to ignore that battle. When I was reading through this, again, I'm not trying to get like a militaristic vibe more so than the text already is giving, but I love World War II movies, right? I love World War II documentaries, movies. Um, it's becoming lost history, unfortunately, for a lot of our, our younger people. But when you, when, you, when you watch those, one of the tragic things is when they send in the fresh green troops behind the seasoned veterans. And there's always this, this horrible kind of, kind of pall over the situation because the veteran troops know what the war looks like. They're wise, they're cautious, they're, they're crafty with the way they work, and yet the green, green troops coming in who have not been prepared for war, they don't have time to train them, they don't know the sounds of battle, they're often the first ones cut down in the fray. That's what Israel is experiencing here, and I dare say that's what Christians experience when we throw the next generation with no training out into a world that we are told wants to eat their souls. We are called to prepare our children, not in a militaristic sense, but in a vitally biblical sense, for the war that we are called to in this world, a war of light versus dark. 2 Timothy chapter 2 speaks of this. In the first three verses, we're told this, You then, my child... Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier in, of Christ Jesus. Paul didn't shy away from this language, did he? Raise them up as a soldier, not a soldier of earthly battles, but a soldier for the battle that matters. Light and dark, serving Christ Jesus. We've got to move quicker through this text. Let's go to point number two. And I want to look at loving deeply. Love deeply. Verses three and four. These are the nations. And here's where we get my, the most entertaining part of the passage because it's all the words I trip over. Here we go. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal, Hamon, as far as Labo, Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And we'll pause there for a moment. So this is the second time we're told Israel is being tested. Second time we're reminded that Israel is being tested. We're told that God has put them in the midst of pagan nations who he knows will make war against them. And he's put them there for a specific reason, to test them. And when I was reading this, I thought of the way we speak about tests typically. Um, you know, we're, we're, nearing, we're nearing the end of the school year for many. Are there any youth in the house who are nearing the end of school? I won't call you out, but we're, we're hitting the point at which high school students, college students, we've got end of term exams. We have, we're looking toward the summer, and yet at the same time, what do we have before we get there? A test. And what do we do with a test? We survive it, right? This was, uh, this was my experience, at least in college. Um, what do you do in a test? You just want to survive. You want to, you want to make it through to fight another day. You want to get on the other side of it. You're not looking forward to the test, certainly. I'm going to grit my teeth. I'm going to take some Advil, and then I'm going to celebrate after I'm done with what? The test, the evil thing that stands between me and something better. We just want to survive. But we do that with serious things, too, serious tests, illness, Family trauma, job displacement, times of spiritual, deep spiritual despondency. What, how do we handle those tests in our life? I'll, I'll speak on my own part. I want to survive them far too often. Grit my teeth, take my Advil, and wait it out. I just want to get past it. Let me encourage you. 
That's not the test we're reading about here. Much like that passage that we read earlier in James, Peter reminds us, you don't just survive a test as a Christian, you revel in the test. And this is something I fear I'm going to be working on in my own heart until I die, that when the test comes, that I don't grit my teeth and try to survive it, but instead that I latch on to the test, that I engage the test, that I wrap my arms around it and, and bring in everything that God would teach me through that test, and that I do it with a smile. And why do I say that? Because Peter tells us to. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, In this you rejoice. Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by, by various trials. You can read test there. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, though it perishes by fire, may be found to result in praise and, and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you see what Peter's telling us there? I know we've been in Peter, uh, in Peter on uh, Wednesday night, so I hope this is making some sense. The tests of life may grieve us. They may hurt. They may be unpleasant. And yet at the same time, through that pain, God says they will build our faith to the praise and glory and honor of Jesus Christ. That's why we do it with a smile. I don't want to survive a test. I want to engage the test, and I want to do it with a song on my lips. That's what the Christian life looks like. We joyfully engage the trials of this life precisely because God's kingdom is being steadily and unstoppably established, and he does so through the testing of his people, preparing the troops for the battle he's called them to. Are you seeing why it's so important, the things in our life which challenge, and yet we read the Lord's Prayer, and he says, Pray that my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your test matters far more than you think it does. Getting back to the text here, though, in, in Judges, I think it's also of note, the, Israel's, the, the, Israel's, the Israelites' testing, the, the testing of the nation of Israel, it's di directly related to obedience. A huge chunk of how we respond to testing in our life, it has to do with obedience. And I want to... I point you back to the text. It says that the test was to weigh whether they would do what? Whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord. The commandments of the Lord, what God has called them to, what God has called his people to. In other words, would they honor God and his commandments in all things, including in the face of war? We could also say, will we, as God's people, honor God's commandments in all things, God is the king over all things, and I would point out his law word is the rule over all things for what is right and wrong, for what is good and bad, for what is light and for what is darkness. How do we know the battle that we're in? How do we know the battle lines that have been drawn? God has spoken. So we cling to his law word to tell us, and that's very important for our time because it's, it's, it's imperative that we never abandon the truths of God's commands because if we're in a war, which Scripture describes us in, and if we're following the King of Kings, which God's children are, then to abandon the rule and reign of the King is treason. It's very important that we stand upon what God has said in His Word, in other words. And again, our combat is ultimately spiritual combat. And you can look to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 for that. But I want to point out, God's law impacts this world. Because what did we just work through with the kids? Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt honor the Lord thy God. These are God's eternal commands, the commands of the king. And this is why we're teaching them to those who are to come after us. Proverbs chapter 14, in verse 34, we read this. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Not just the Hivites, not just the Jebusites. Any people that shake their fist at the Almighty King, sin is a reproach against them. So here's the question as we're rounding the corner to our third point. But here's the question. Who, who do we serve as Christians? Who do we serve? Who do we truly love? And again, I'm not just talking about vocal acclamation. I'm talking about if who we are determines what we do. Are we showing with our lives and with our loves who it is that we truly love? With whom have we made covenant? To whom are we ultimately and entirely loyal? And this is the reason I ask these questions. The answer is that the test is how God shows where the allegiance lies. 
How do you get from who you are to what you do? God gives you a test to expose the true allegiances of our hearts. Times of difficulty inevitably will reveal our authenticity. If you want to know where my heart lies, press on me a bit, right? When the pressure comes, I'm going to reveal where I'm, where I'm placing my trust and my affections. We will show where our heart lies precisely when the pressure comes. But this is why we have to be very cautious. Brothers and sisters, we have to be very cautious with our heart's affections. Very cautious with what we place our love on, what we give our lives to. We have to be very mindful that if who we are determines what we do and the test is a way of God revealing the heart's condition, we have to be very guarded biblically, spiritually, Christianly with where we place our affections. I've quoted him before, but William Carey nailed this one for me. He's, he's called the mo- father of modern missions. But William Carey said, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. We have to be very thoughtful. If we're called to something of nothing short of light, broadcasting into death and sin and despair and darkness. If that's what we're called to do as Christians, we need to be very mindful of how we dedicate our lives. Third thing this morning, love faithfully. Love faithfully. Verse 5 and 6 again. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites. Let me pause. This isn't good, okay? Just in case you've lost, I know we've jumped all over. This is not good. We'll start back. Verse 5. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. So there's three things that happen in the conclusion of this passage, three little quick-fire signs of destruction. First, the Israelites lived among the pagan nations. They didn't conquer the pagan nations. They didn't bring the pagan nations to worship and follow the triune God. No, no, no. They lived among the nations. Secondly, the nations and the Israelites exchanged brides. What does that mean? It means they became family. They became family with the pagan nations. And then finally and inevitably, they worshiped the pagan gods. They're among them. They're family with them. They worship the gods that the pagan nations worship them. And this may not have hit you because hit you, uh, uh, we haven't been in this book. So let me walk you through it real, real quick. So first, the Israelites lived, we're told, among these people. And we live in a day of, of what, what could be called like a secular pluralism. You know, we celebrate in many circles the just kind of mixing and melting together of many different faith streams, many different beliefs about many different things. So we might hear that and it may sound like a good thing. Oh, that's good. Israel went among the pagan nations and they're, they're chumming around with them like that sounds like they're buddies. That's a good thing. But this is not some sort of sign of coexistence. This isn't some sort of celebration of religious diversity. This isn't so, some sort of sign of success of an early pluralistic society. No, no, no. This is an indictment against God's people. God's people lived among the pagans, and they became like the pagans, and it's an indictment, not a good thing. This is going to bring judgment upon them. And why is this so destructive? Again, this is tough for us many times as modern Christians to understand, but why is this so destructive for them? Because they were called to follow God, they were called to obey His commands, and they were called to remember His works. The sound of battle, the wars He had brought them through, the provision of God, they were called to worship that God. The nations were called to obey the God of Israel, not to accept the uh, the people of the God of Israel as if they were their own. This is the reverse of what God has called his people to do here. But instead, Israel, we're told, they forget God's command. We're told they tolerated and even lived as part of the pagan nations, part of them. They intermarried their children with one another, and finally they served their gods. And that's the part that should be unthinkable. Especially if you've read through uh, the book of Joshua and then into the book of Judges, this last sentence should be unthinkable. They served their gods. I want you to think of God's provision bringing them out of Egypt through Moses. God's provision guiding them food to mouth, water to mouth through the wilderness and through all the wanderings because of their disobedience, bringing them eventually to the promised land, providing Joshua as a leader after Moses and then the judges of Israel. 
All of this, why? That they may cling to the Lord who leads them. God wants his people latched on to him that he might lead them through the storm. So how could they go so far, so far as to worship pagan gods? How has Israel, and this is the, again, this is the whole question of judges. You run into it every chapter or two. How? How could you go that far and get that far from the Lord who's called you? Because we all love. Every human on this planet loves. They love something. We all obey commands. All of us. There's not a human on this planet that does not obey commands. We all worship. In fact, I would argue we are made as worshipful creatures. We cannot help but worship. It's not a matter of whether you will do those things. The matter is which. Not whether, but which. Which things will you love? Which commands will you obey? Which God, ultimately, will you serve? This is the test of Israel. Which God? The God of covenant or the God of the pagan nations? The test comes in because we will worship what we worship, rather, will reflect where our hearts are. Everyone will worship. The test comes in to expose who or what are you actually worshiping. We may fool ourselves. We may pay lip service, as many do. But we're, we will ultimately worship where our hearts lie. And every people does this. Let me just point this out. I know I'm short on time, but we're right at the end. But please don't miss this part. Every people on this planet does this. Every people does this. There are always moral codes that are enforced. And if you're thinking, like, what's a moral code look like? Say this, don't say that. That's a moral code. And every people's got moral codes on this planet. There's always flags and banners that openly declare our allegiance. I'll just let that one sit. There's always laws and governments that enforce the ethical codes. All societies legislate morality. But in all of those, the question remains, it's not a matter of whether we will do those things, but which things will we do? And ultimately, which Lord will we serve? Who we are determines what we do in this regard. And this indictment, which I would say is an indictment against the Christian church as well, is that we're often quite apathetic. What I fear for the Christian church in our day and age is that we are quite apathetic and allow the darkness to seek to catechize us and our children, which will ultimately result in worshiping the gods of the culture. This is the story throughout Scripture. This is not tinfoil hat. This is something that the Christian church must always guard against, being catechized by the world around us, and specifically the darkness around us, that will ultimately lead to a worship of their gods. And this is where I think it's very good that we remember the words of the covenant God, Deuteronomy chapter 5. God says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. So here's my conclusion to this passage. You see how fun Judges is? It's powerful though, isn't it? Because, because at least Judges, it tends to really expose in visceral terms what's actually going on behind this. And this, this is my conclusion. When we declare from this pulpit and from our homes and in our prayers, when we declare Christ is Lord, that's a battle cry. Okay, that's the way I'm defining battle and war in this. That is a battle cry, and I dare say declaring Christ as Lord has been a battle cry since Christ walked on this earth physically. It's always been a battle cry for the Christian. But God, in his mercy, has brought, I think, some sounds of war back to us again, and we, as his children, have to know what that war looks like. In his mercy, I think God is showing us a little bit of the sounds of battle so that we might know war and so that God might remind us. If we've forgotten war, God might remind us. And if you're wondering what that reminding looks like, it means God's going to give us battles to fight. God's going to let us see the glow on the horizon of battles off in, the, off in the far reaches. God, in other words, is going to give you the blessed opportunity in his mercy and graciousness to stand for the king when it truly matters. God is gracious when he reminds his people of war. So in conclusion... Let me wrap it up with this. Brothers and sisters, I would, I would say this is then our call. If Christ tarries for 10,000 years, or if Christ ret returns relatively soon, whether you or whether I 
live to a ripe old age or whether God is pleased in his grace and mercy to call one of us home today, whether we are spared the pains of persecution or whether we find ourselves in the thick of a fierce battle in any of those circumstances, we're called as Christians to love deeply. And that starts with a love for the covenant God who has saved us. Love deeply. We're called to live deeply. Thankfully, in other words, not gritting our teeth and bearing it, but smiling and laughing and singing through the very trials of this life. Love deeply, live thankfully, declare the king's law faithfully to all corners of his creation, that there is a king and he has spoken and he has spoken in his word and all creation bows to that creator. To live faithfully, but to fight the darkness faithfully. We as Christians are called to a battle And it's very important that we not forget what that battle looks like and what those sounds sound like. Brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Father God, Lord, I'm so challenged by this passage God, we're not called to pick up sword and shield and to do physical combat. And for that, I'm grateful, God. Lord, neither are we called to win the war because it's a war that has already been won in Christ. We're thankful, God, that you have done the work needed. And yet, God, you've called your children to participate in your victory. God, we're called to put down roots. We're called to teach our children well. We're called to nurture this church family that you've called us to be a part of. We're called to declare your word faithfully. Lord, we're called to call others to repentance, whether those be friends, co-workers, governors, presidents, nations. Lord, we're called to proclaim your truth to all the world that you have created. Lord, we're humbled and we're invigorated by that mission. God, I pray that for us as a church, Lord, that you would find us to be a people who love you deeply, that serve you faithfully, that proclaim your truth and your law to all of the world. Lord, a people that have not forgotten the battle to which we're called, which is not a battle of flesh and blood, Lord, but it is a battle against the rulers and authorities and powers of darkness in the heavenly places. God, we're called to a glorious task We're thankful that in all these things, Lord, we're following a Savior who has already won the victory. God, let us be faithful to fight where you've called us to. We ask all these things in your Son's name. Amen.